Raul Casantusan Navarro, PhD, is currently professor and chair of the conducting department of the University of the Philippines College of Music. He was among the recipients of the one UP professorial chair for outstanding teaching and creative work the University of the Philippines Artist Award, and the UP Distinguished Alumni for Culture and the Arts Award, with UP Diliman Centennial Professor, also professorial, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, and in addition, the UP Diliman Centennial Professorial Chair Award. He also received several international publication awards from the UP system. Dr. Navarro authored four books, among them his Colonial na Patakaran, at nagbabagong kamalayang Filipino, musika sa pampublikong para paaralan sa Pilipinas, um, which won the 2000, 2008 National Book Award. Um, musika at bagong lipunan, pagbuo ng lipunang Filipino uh, from the Ateneo Press in 2014, which was chosen as a finalist in the social science category of the 2015 National Book Award. His musika sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas uh, panahong Diskurso, and his most recent Musika ng Pananako, Panahon ng Hapon sa Pilipinas, were published by the UP Press in 2016 and 2021, respectively. May I introduce to you our moderator for this uh, first panel, Dr. Navarro. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all doing well despite the pandemic. For the next hour or so, we're going to witness the research presentations of Dr. Jonas Baez, Ms. Rachel Ong Shu Ying, and Dr. Made Pantal Hood, that comprise the presenters for Panel 1 of the Asia Pacific Society for Ethnomusicology 2021 online conference. Just a few reminders, though, before we move on to the presentation. The presentations are between 17 minutes and a little under 24 minutes long. You may write your questions via the chat box, and those will be answered after the last presentation. Please follow these formats. Eight, uh, one to whom the question is addressed, then your question. You may also opt to raise your hand also via our chat box during the Q&A portion of the session to directly ask our panel presenters. You may turn on your microphone once I call your name. Thank you. I will now introduce our first speaker. Dr. Jonas Baez, composer, ethnomusicologist, and cultural activist studied at the University of the Philippines and the Freiburg Music Hochschule in Germany. He earned a doctorate in Philippine studies from the University of the Philippines with a dissertation titled Modes, Modes of Appropriation in Philippine Indigenous Music, the Politics of the Production of Cultural Difference. Bias's writings discourse on how a national body politic impacts the cultivation of music among marginalized peoples like the Iraya Mangyan, the Dumagat, or the Bagobo. These writings were published in academic journals like Ethnomusicology, Wakana Seni, Perfect Beats, and the Journal of Intercultural Studies, among others. His major music compositions are creative responses to his research where in utilizing unorthodox sound materials like bamboo bird flutes, iron nail chimes, stones, leaves, or wraps are incorporating the audience into the performance. Urban spaces transform into imaginary rainforests to sound. Those special sound events are meant to invoke the living spaces and the ancestral domain of indigenous peoples who are physically encroached and are perennially threatened by the multinational industries of the global political economy. Let us now listen to Dr. Jonas Baez. Greetings. Um, the title of my paper is Identity, Marginality, and the Iraya Mangyan Engagement, Transcending the Dichotomies of Difference. You know, um, perhaps to many of my colleagues, uh, this topic might already be dated. I've been talking about this for generations, I guess. However, I still believe in the continuous relevance of this topic because the threat to the ancestral domain, militarization, and the encroachment of gigantic mining and logging companies continue to the present, especially in other areas of the Philippines. In this talk, I have a two-pronged objective. First, I would like to describe Iraya Mangyan identity within the rubric of their peripheral place in Philippine society, 
a place that has excluded them from the state's general agenda for development. It is a fact that continues even to the present conditions of, global, of the global pandemic, as photojournalist Robert Boschaga writes in a 2020 report on the dire conditions of exclusion that continue in the COVID. Second, I would like to describe my own explorations of avenues by which those conditions of exclusion might transcend towards condition of inclusion, meaning that the struggles of the Irayamangan and other indigenous peoples in the country be incorporated in the broader struggles of Philippine society in the global political economy. It is within those objectives that I intend to interrogate ethnomusicology on the level of ontology, suggesting an approach as a response and an analysis of, this, of the process that seem to underlie such transcendence of the dichotomies of difference. In addressing this conference with this talk, I seek to answer that question which the Iraya Mangyan community leader Mamay Angel asked me back in 1985. What good could your study of our songs do for the disputes over our ancestral domain? However, this, this leads to an understanding of the social backdrop of the Philippines itself. First and foremost, I would not hesitate to consider the Philippines as a third world nation, and that label developing, in quotation marks, is rather misleading. First, our country has no industries to call its own, resulting to a large surplus labor. And connected with this is a large sector of society living below the poverty line and remaining to be miseducated and easily lured by the powerful agents of the political oligarchy. The political structure remains to be essentially feudal, with a landed elite taking up major roles in the economic and at times the political arena. And those socio-economic conditions directly impact the living spaces and ancestral domain of indigenous peoples living in the rainforest. This in turn have direct repercussions on how they are seen by the Philippine milieu as wards of the state who are implicated into the national body politic as mere bearers of a pre-colonial culture rather as generally part of a struggle that is national in scale. In relation to those conditions, the Iraya Mangyan who have lost their tradition due to the quagmire of their marginal living conditions and their increasing contact with lowland might largely disappear in the eyes of the ethnomusicologists. However, it is suggested in this talk that ethnomusicology might want to explore the various avenues of advocacy transcending its own notions of being, of what it is. My engagement with the Iraya Mangyan began on a brief field study in 1982. However, a deeper connection commenced in 1983, which continued up until 1987, when I started to embark on a field work in a place called Kaagutayan, Kaagutayan can be reached from the northeastern town of San Teodoro, going inland towards the foothills that lead to Mount Halcon in the central highlands of the island of Mindoro. I was looking back at everything I've done on the Iraya Mangyan, and I could say that perhaps my published writings on the Iraya Mangyan best, this document, best document this transforming and subsequent transcendence of my engagement with the communities. All of these within the underlying impetus of understanding their developing an identity, the identity that comes from themselves. In 1987, I published a paper that documents the changing taste in singing and song style as certain points of conflict emerging between community elders who struggled to cultivate a traditional song form called Igwai, and a younger generation 
of, of the community who cultivated what was then a new genre called the bulaklakan. Having an eight-syllable text instead of a tr the tr traditional seven syllables, and the incorporation of even more Tagalog words made the elders in the community feel this genre to be a Tagalog intrusion. Can you believe that? It was also in this year that I was literally hunted down by a group of thugs who, according to the Iraya Mangan, were hired by a logging company in their midst, who for months and that time were encroaching on the ancestral land and scaring them off their villages. The culmination of that actually was in 1987 when literally the thugs went to the village looking for me with these long machetes and bolos. It was such a dramatic moment that my, my, my host, Angel Añas, had to hide me in his house and then slowly host me down to the mountain trail going back to the village when things were cleared. As a result of that condition, by 1988, I could only communicate with key persons in the community by means of letters. And I was, I'm, I'm, I was talking to a good friend of mine named Henry, who apparently, uh, whose family is a very close friend of mine, who wrote to me, and he can write letters. In 1989, after this, I published a paper on the spirit calling song Marayao and the changing context of power in the Iraya Mangyan worldview. This paper documents the epidemic of measles that claimed so many lives in the villages a year before. The very sad demise of their community leader, Ang Mamay Angel, and the desperate realization that this new disease could not be healed by spirit rituals, but by means of money to be paid to the doctors in hospitals, made them see themselves in this dire uh, state of helplessness. One of the letters that Henry wrote me implied that the measles might have come from the lowlanders who were coming into their village many times when the mining and the logging companies were beginning to, to step up their, their operations within their area. Towards the 1990s, however, I encountered the Iraya Mangyan in social movements that were on a national scale. And this includes the Sandugov or One Blood Festival that happens every year, which was initiated by progressive organizations of civil society. It is here where I start to see a transcendence in the Iraya Mangyan notion of self and environment, meaning identity, no? as they realized that there were other indigenous peoples having the same plight as they had. And in a paper delivered during the first APSEC conference held in Osaka in 1996, I discussed the sociopolitical dynamics of this incorporation as symbolized by the progression of the traditional song Igwai to what I mentioned earlier as the Bulaklakan. However, the greatest turning point of their social history was to be in 2002 up to 2004, when the entire community of Kaagutayan and other communities among the Alangan Mangyan and the Hanano'o Mangyan of Mindoro, other, these are other upland groups living in the island, had to leave behind their ancestral land and with the help of NGOs and church organizations, seek refuge in other provinces because of militarization. And with this, they were eventually housed in a refugee center called Kanlungan, somewhere in Cavite, in the southern Tagalog province. And there they were housed not only with other Mindoro indigenous peoples, but also those from Rizal, all of them fleeing militarization. They step up operations, which had to do a lot with low intensity conflict concepts, was very much discussed in a paper I published uh, called Mangyan Internal Refugees from Indoro Island, which was published sometime in 2007, some years after the experience. 
But I would say that in this situation, while staying with them in this refugee center, that despite the fact that the Iraya Mangan were put in this very vulnerable position within the milieu of Philippine society, I believe that such a condition also enabled them to empower themselves, at least on the level of the cultural and social imaginary. Their life stories as indigenous peoples have developed into a level of deep understanding of their place in the national milieu, which Paulo Freire would call conscientization. The maturity of their identity is, to say the least, a product of struggle. Finding safety in a refugee center, which they called Kanlungan, we, or a group of concerned artists, were constantly in direct contact with them, and in the process, it was they who were engaging us with their stories and asking us to tell those to many others. With those are the initial analysis by elders of these communities that those military operations were only a prelude to a bigger operation that had to do with mining and logging. And this situation became an opening for creative endeavors on my part. First, it was the giving of almost all the copies of a newly published CD, which I call Nostalgia in a Denuded Rainforest, which, in fact, in this sense, actually let them feel that I returned their music to them. But this sort of of, of dead end, despite the fact that we, we, we garnered so many stories from spending two afternoons listening to this CD and they telling the stories about this and that person, actually needed a more potent and in fact a more global uh, output. And that led me to the conceptualization of a piece of music of mine, which is perhaps the most widely performed piece of mine called Patangis Buaya. Now, Patangis Buaya is a phrase in Iraya Mangyan which means uh, sound that makes the crocodiles weep. It was said that in the last portion of their, their, uh, their uh, legend, the great hunter Alitawu uh, lost his wife because his wife Diaga was kidnapped by an evil person called Valeria Yasun, who raped his wife, and his wife, who could not take the, the, the pain and the agony, killed herself. Alitawu was informed of this while on a hunting trip, when the birds told him about it, and also the bees told him about it. And coming back to his house and not finding his wife, made him think that perhaps that it was the, the bees were telling him that story. So he calls to his dog again, his hunting dog, with his flute, the bangsi. And this flute call, which was so, so full of pain and anguish, it made even the crocodiles in Mindoro weep. Eventually he hunt, hunted, he was able to hunt down this, this evil man. Uh, and in the fight, in learning of the death of his wife in the fight also in some in some uh, versions that he also died in the process and that his his uh, his body his blood was scattered all over the island for his descendants to remember him now Patangis Buaya as a composition is has a different life story I guess what uh, might relate to this life story it was uh, composed in 2003, about that year, I encountered the Iraya Mangyan as refugees. And I thought of composing it for four wind instruments from any culture, And but the premiere was done with recorders. Uh, recorders. And through the years, this work developed from a mere empty spatial work, premiered in the temple in Tokyo, into a work that incorporates the audience uh, performed, the last performance of which was just before the pandemic in 2019 at the University of the Philippines here in a garden 
of the Abelardo Hall. And in California, in a garden called Descanso, also in the garden. The notion of creating Patangris Buwaya was to tell the story of the Iraya Mangyan and in doing so, invite perhaps similar stories that might happen to other peoples in other parts of the world. And the other, the other, the other notion was also, in case this is performed within mainstream populations, for them to understand the plight of indigenous peoples like the Iraya Mangyan. On a national level, I thought of, Ira, of, of the Patangis Buwaya to be a way by which, most importantly, this notion of exclusion of the Iraya who have, uh, who have uh, suffered so much of this might be transformed into a notion of inclusion as the audience takes part in the performance and the delivery of this work. The narrative continues within the struggle of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the people, the struggle of the people to be heard. But as this collectively comes into being in many parts of the world, I believe that perhaps in the future people will understand the plight of groups of people, indigenous peoples like the Iraya Mangyan, caught in this quagmire of change brought in from the outside by trans transnational firms who actually encroach on their ancestral domain. It is hoped that in this way, this fluidity of identity, from an identity incurred in, in, in exclusion into one that is in communion, in, in, in inclusion, become the main progression of this work with the Iraya Mangyan. Thank you for listening and I hope we can continue to discuss this, this topic as we move along within this session.